Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking us out on our live stream here, uh, Biola School of Cinema and Media Arts here at Biola University. Are you guys excited to be here for the uh, In Focus Forum tonight? Yeah. All right. If you guys are joining us for the first time, whether it's on live stream or here in Studio A uh, on our campus, uh, our In Focus Forums are a time where we bring in some of the best of the uh, uh, the best that the industry has right here to our students and to uh, our creative community uh, to talk about techniques, uh, to talk about topics of the industry, so that we can all thrive as artists uh, and content creators. And so that's what In Focus Forum is all about. Uh, we would love for you guys to engage with what's happening today. There's going to be a number here for all of you that are live in the studio and you guys can text in your questions. If you guys are watching on the live stream though, we would love for you to uh, comment a question and we'll make sure to send that up to our moderator tonight, who's Camille Tucker, uh, uh, and I'll introduce her in a second. If you are watching and you are a high school student and maybe you're interested in attending film school, you're looking at film schools right now, you're figuring out where you want to go, we would love for you to check us out. Go to biola.edu slash film. Uh, you'll see a little uh, tab there that says the application uh, uh, menu option. If you click that, it'll walk you through our application process. Uh, December 1st is our uh, regular deadline. February 1st is our extended deadline. So we're like a lot of other film schools, you got to apply to Biola and apply to Cinema and Media Arts separately. So we would love uh, to, to hear from you. Uh, we'd love to have you come visit campus and check us out. Uh, and without further ado, let's get going on tonight's event. So we have uh, Camille Tucker moderating our discussion tonight. Camille is one of our own professors here at the School of Cinema and Media Arts, runs our screenwriting program. Uh, she's incredible. She sold multiple screenplays to Universal and Sony and New Line, uh, and she runs this uh, program with some amazing screenwriting students that are part of uh, our, our film school here. Uh, and then our honored guest, uh, Tom Schulman, Academy Award winning writer. Will you guys help me in welcoming uh, them up to the stage and let's get this going. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Testing. Yeah. Just ruined the whole live, <laughs> live cast. Yeah. You should have known you were going to get that. As soon as they um, tell me I can't go to the bathroom, that's uh -oh. all I think about. <laughs> yeah. Trouble. Um, so welcome, welcome everyone. We are so fortunate this evening to have writer, director, producer Tom Shulman. He has a BA in philosophy from Vanderbilt University. He's the writer, obviously, of Dead Poets Society. Can we get a woohoo? <laughs> Which is directed by Peter Weir and starring Robin Williams and a young Ethan Hawke. And the film won Best Screenplay Oscar in 1989 and was nominated also for Best Picture and Best Director. Tom has also written Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, What About Bob, Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag, which he also directed. And he was the producer, one of the producers on Indecent Proposal, starring Robert Redford, Woody Harrelson, and Demi Moore. So let's give it up for Tom Shulman. Thank you. Um, I also want to take a moment to just thank all of you for being here. Thank our uh, Biola Cinema and Media Arts faculty, staff, students, all that were involved in putting this evening on. Taylor for In Focus Forms and all the amazing stuff we're doing. So let's give it for that too. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to start with a question that I'm sure you get all the time, but you can indulge us this evening. Um, Dead Poet Society for many young people and, and audiences is just a, a life-changing film and a very prolific film. So I would love to know, I read that it's semi-autobiographical, and I'd love to know what was your inspiration for the film? Where did you get the idea? Um, there were sort of two inspirational moments or moments of inspiration. Uh, <clears throat> the first was I uh, I went to USC f graduate school of cinema for about a semester and a half, and uh, got I think I was too cool for school, <laughs> so I, I left and went to a place called the Actors and Directors Lab, which was mm. uh, uh, in Beverly Hills, and and the uh, teacher there uh, had a teacher, and his teacher was named Jack uh, named uh, Harold Clerman, and Harold Clerman was sort of a grand wizard of Broadway. He had, uh, was one of the founders of the group theater, uh, directed probably 40 plays on Broadway, uh, was a critic for the magazine The Nation, 
and sort of felt, felt like he had been everywhere on earth throughout the entire history of mankind. He knew everything. And he would come out to L.A. about every two months and look at some of the work that we did at the Actors and Directors Lab and then sort of hold forth. And he was one of the best speakers I've ever heard. I sort of, I think there's some of him online. He gave, he talked down at the Amundsen Theater maybe when in his late seventies or early eighties. And he's like a human volcano. He would get wow. up on this just talk like this and he was <laughs> passionate and you'd go home that night and you'd just feel like you could change the world. You'd learn so much, you knew so much and then you'd wake up the next morning and realize, nah, it's not gonna be me. <laughs> but uh but I wanted to write something about him and uh so I started working on a on a story about him as a teacher and a, a group of acting students, and it just started to get kind of Hollywood inbred, not good. So, so I it was first about an acting teacher. Yes, wow. Yes, okay. and the the Robert Sean Leonard, who in the in the movie played the the kid who wants to become an actor, that character sort of survived that draft, and then the draft went in the drawer. And about a year later, I woke up and I thought, oh, it's not, that's the wrong teacher. I should go back and pick the teacher that was my sophomore English teacher in high school, mm -hmm. uh, who was a very antic, wonderful teacher. I, I couldn't really remember what he taught so much as just the affect and the way he did things. And uh, so I thought that's the story. And then it's the story, it's really the student's story, how mm -hmm. it ins he inspires them to 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 take chances and so forth and um, and that's, that's did you go to a strict school like that where they were trying to suppress creativity and and did he they, help it, you to find your own voice or was that part of your imagination I, I think it I mean the school and you know I, I, who in high school feels like they're not so trying to suppress <laughs> you know it, it was just. Uh, I think that the school I went to was an all boys day school. Okay. The the headmaster or principal of the school uh was had was sort of from an earlier era. So, you know, even though I was in school in the 60s and that whole thing was starting to happen, right. he he would really would have preferred it to take it back into a more boarding school type of place. So, mm. as a character in the movie, he worked, you know, cuz he was strict and 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 that sort of thing. But the school was not like that. It, mm -hmm. it had had probably been that way 20 years before. And I read that the Ethan Hawke character is the character that's most like you. And yeah. you and he's like shy, he can barely speak. That just doesn't That's the way I was. Really? I mean, yeah. I mean it, at our school you had to give two spe uh, twice in in the in your high school experience you were supposed to give a talk, 5 minute talk in front of the whole school. Mm -hmm. And I managed to find a way to get sick, skip, do whatever I needed to do. Wow. I was the only one in my class that never gave either either talk. Uh, when, <laughs> it, it was so bad that our Latin teacher would, would go around the room every day and she would go down the desks and everybody would read a line and translate it and talk about it a little bit. She skipped me every time because I was so shy and, wow. un, and awkward. She just finally decided. And every time she skipped me, my friends who hated having to do it, we all hated having to do it, she'd skip me, they'd all go, why is, why is he you know? <laughs> and they really, it, she, 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 uh, left for a week and there was a substitute who didn't skip me and that was oh, awful. But, so uh, so that. no, that was kind of who I was, but you know, in, in a world of fantasy where you're writing a story, who, who wouldn't put themselves as the hero of the mm -hmm. story? So, uh, you know. So yeah. when you put it down and then you came back to it and you realized to go back to the high school teacher, is that when everything started to come together in terms of, coming up with the Ethan Hawke characters representing yourself and what these boys were going through in this experience? Sort of. I think the first, next uh, pass was to, to change the teacher and start writing some of the thing, just writing, you know, anything that came into my head that, that the teacher would say. And that went a lot. And sorry, picking characters that I went to high school with and whatnot, putting them in there, and that failed too. Because oh. I, I realized, and I put that in the drawer, and about a year later, I realized, oh, it's, it's, I've got to pick people who 
from my life, not necessarily who I went to high school with, whose lives would have been affected by this teacher, because that's the story, oh. the, how, he, how he changes their lives. So once I realized that, then I, was, then, then, then I wrote the script. Okay. And there's a lesson in that. You can put a script in the drawer and get it back, guys. Yeah. Just because yeah. it doesn't work then doesn't mean that it's not good and that it's not material you can come back to. It's rare in my experience that things that don't work ever work. It's just, and I beat my head against the wall, and I'm talking to people going, but if he did this and did this, you know, and they, when they don't work, it's hell getting them to work. But this right. one, for some reason, you know, just did, did this, the, the third time somehow, it did. It did. And I think it did. <laughs> 20 years from now, it may not. But how, yeah. okay, so the themes of finding your own voice, freedom, et cetera, how did you arrive at those? I mean, did you always know that was what you were grappling with when you wanted to tell this story? Or that, did that begin to develop? How, do you, how did you develop the big ideas of the script? You know, they just, they just came as I wrote, you know, and it was, I, I think of it as almost like you, what happens when you go, in the old psychiatric, you know, you lie down on a couch and you just start talking and mm -hmm. you don't really know what's going to come out or how to analyze it until you get it out. So, you know, in, in a certain sense, you know, in writing, you're tapping into your own unconscious. And then after you've done that for a while, you start to try to see what themes are, are coming up and then how you want to shape them. Okay. So that's, that's what happened. One other thing is, and this is for whether writing students and non-writing students, I heard that you do a lot of pre-writing, and the outline for Dead Poets Society was 130 pages? Uh, is that true? Probably more than that. I mean, Okay, yeah, there yeah. you go, guys. Don't get upset when I'm giving you all this homework. Right. I mean, <laughs> talk, planning, talk a little bit about is... that outlining process, and why did you do such a detailed, or do you do that for every script? I did it for every script for a while, and then I got lazy. But oh. <laughs> uh, uh, my outlining, I, I take notes in, in my computer, and just for you know, days, weeks, sometimes years on end, and a file will get bigger and bigger. And at a certain point, when I think I know the beginning, middle, and the end, and I think it's something I'm still interested in and want to do, I, I type, I print the whole thing out, and, and I make sure everything, every idea is in a block and that there's going to be a space between every idea. And an idea could be a whole scene or a line of dialogue or just, you know, a phrase or whatever. And then I... Once I print it out, I cut all of those things into strips. A lot wow. of people do this with cards on on the wall. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but now I have a pile of strips that's you know this high and just all over the place. And I'll just pick the first one up and go, okay, this is kind of a beginning first third idea. Put that there, and the next one is an ending. Put that there, and I'll divide them into those three piles. And then I take the first pile and I go to the far left corner of the room, and it's just me and a desk and a chair and my computer on top and a printer and all, as much space the rest of the room, the floor is bare. So I put wow. the first, you know, I'll pick it up. If this is a title, ah, that goes in the far left. And I just start moving these strips all across the room and the thing just keeps building and I know that I don't really have a good idea how I'm gonna get from scene six to scene seven, but I'm not worried about that because I got all this other work to do and while I'm doing that other work, Oh, I know how I'm going to get to six to seven. That'll pop into my brain, and I'll type that out, print it out, and put it over there between six and seven. And you know, it takes days to do this, <laughs> but but while, and you, commitment. while you're doing it, your unconscious is at work. Mm -hmm. You know, they they always you know, you've, I'm sure you've all had that experience of you grind on something, you're trying to figure something out and can't do it, and then you you know get out of the shower or you turn the water on and ah there's the idea well this has that same effect because i'm spending all this time doing all this busy work kind of relaxed you know yeah this mm -hmm. is good and nothing's worrying me at this point because and then i did the the connective tissue and the better ideas start to come and then then i then i take all those strips and i put them into a a, a notebook I put, you know, like five or six of them or however many fit on a page, mm -hmm. tape them to a page, three whole page, and then put those together in notebooks. And then I sit down with a notebook, open the first notebook. I've got five ideas for the title. All right, let's take that one. And I type that in. And then it's essentially a very detailed outline of how to write the script.
Very detailed, yeah, very detailed. Yeah, yeah. And in that process, does that help you? So in other words, you can weed out your maybe you're like, you know what, this is this scene doesn't belong. Yeah. Or maybe there was something you thought was going to happen later in the script that you can move. So you're not into the writing process. And I talk to my students about this sometimes where you're falling in love with the dialogue or falling in love with the scene. You get a chance to begin to move your material around and sort of see what's working yep. before you make that commitment. That's right. I mean, mm -hmm. and, you know, there's nothing etched in stone at that point, mm -hmm. And you don't have to worry about. I mean, if you have something that you like and you think it goes in a certain place, you put it there. And But later you may go, ah, this doesn't really work here, so I'm going to try it somewhere else. Turns out it doesn't work anywhere. And first thing you do is put it in a pile of things, that, labeled things that must go in this script. And then later it moves into the question mark period. And then later it moves into a pile of trash. And it just that's, <laughs> you know, and you don't, and by the, but... Hopefully, I mean, the reason you get rid of things that you love is that they don't serve the larger whole. Right. And they, you know, as great as you think they are, they're just, they're, they'll ruin the bigger piece, and the bigger piece is more important. Right. Now, was the suicide from the beginning? You mentioned that the Neil character survived the first draft. Yeah. So it, there wasn't, a, it wasn't as dark. I actually read it, do you wrote it as a comedy? First? No, no, no. But it was funnier than the movie. It was funnier. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Now, did it become more serious when Peter Weir came on to direct, or yes. did okay? Mm -hmm. He okay. Yeah. And which was fine, but I mean the tone of it and the way it's lit, and it's just a little less funny, I think, mm -hmm. than the a little less antic than, mm -hmm. than the than the and and probably for the better because there were scenes in there we we shot two hours and 45 minutes worth of movie and it's I think the movie's 220 mm -hmm. so there are two scenes that we that I basically you know had to almost twist Peter's arm just to get him to shoot and he said all right I'll shoot them but we're never going to use them and I said well at least shoot them so there's the chance and he left one in and then and which it, scene was that it, it, it's it's a scene where uh, I th uh, the Robin Williams character goes to the cave in in a scene and mm. that just and there was a scene in the script that he made me cut too before, and where so, other than that, the the most of it survived. But it was just tonally a little darker as a movie. Right. And for those um, who many of you may be familiar with Peter Weir, but Peter Weir directed Witness, Year of Living Dangerously, Gallipoli, and The Truman Show. So he's and he's Australian. He yes. is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great guy. How Amazing. was the process working with him? Working with fabulous. Peter Weir. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. You know, he the, we sat down and he said, you know, how come you're not directing this? You write like a director. And I said, what mm -hmm. does that mean? He said, well, I can just see what 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 you're where the scenes work. And I said, I am so happy to have you as a you know, this would never get made with me as a director. It barely is getting made at all. And uh, so he said, well, you know, I want you on the set, and I, I know you That's want to direct, so just. Just consider me sort of, you know, a mentor, and I'll, you know, said I've made eight movies, and I'm wow. happy to help any any way I can, and so. You That's know, rare. I took him up on that, and he would after the first day of the shoot. He, you know, he after every take, I'd be right in his face, going, "Here's where he's supposed to do that, and then <laughs> this, and he missed that line." And it, after about uh, fifteen minutes, Peter said, "Do me a favor, just count to ten before you say anything." <laughs> and I said, "Oh, okay, I'm leaving. I'm going home. You don't." And he said, "No, no, no. Don't get your feelings hurt. Just, just." He said, "I just need to have my own thoughts." For a second, I said, "Okay." So we did that. That kind of muted me for a while. And the second day, I said something about the way Robin was doing something, and he said, "Well, you know, you want to direct? You direct the scene." And I said, uh -oh. "Peter, you know, come on, I'm, I don't get pissed off." He said, "No, no, I'm fine. Just really, you want to learn? Direct the scene." Okay. So I walk out there to talk to Robin. <laughs> I see Robin look over at Peter, and Peter goes. Okay, so I gave Robin <laughs> an idea. Robin did it, and I it was, he was getting ready to do it. I said to Peter, "What if what if this doesn't work?" He goes, "I'll fix it." I said, "Okay." So Robin did the thing I asked, and Peter said, "What do you think?" And I said, "I don't think it works." And he goes, "I don't either." So he said, "So we'll just continue the way I had it before." And I said, <laughs> "Okay." <laughs> you know? But there are n almost no directors in Hollywood, none since, that have been that generous, very and generous. confident. Yeah, mm -hmm. amazing. Speaking of which, working with Robin Williams, um, rest in peace, yeah. uh, just an amazing comedian. And I would think that with a comedian like that on set, uh, there's improv. So were there any scenes that he improv and, and brought 
um, to the process where, and I know that's hard for a writer because yeah, you're like, no, my words, I mean, my words. No, it was interesting because the, he, he came, he was doing a play in New York and we were shooting in, in Delaware. So he came down to do one day and he was going to be gone for two weeks and then come back and, and really get into it. And that day he was so on book, so word perfect that it was not funny. It was, there was just, and I was terrified. I was oh. like, uh oh. Because, I mean, I'd always been concerned that the sort of synthesis between Robin's humor and the humor of the character, I didn't know where they were going to connect. And so I thought, uh oh, this is going to be deadly. And Peter, I'm at that point yammering, and Peter's, <laughs> hey, what are we going to do? And he's going, just relax. I don't know. I don't know. No. So when Robin left, Peter said, I've got two weeks to think about it. We'll figure something out. So we got, he came, Robin came back, and we were doing one of the first scenes in the classroom, and it was sort of the same thing. Mm -hmm. And Peter said, let's, let's try something. He said, Robin, if you had to just come in and teach these kids something, like your stand up, what would you do? He said, I don't know, I'd read to him maybe, do a little Shakespeare. And he said, all right, let's, let's do that, and we'll just roll camera. So at that point, Robin realized, oh, it's a dialogue. He came in, and that was, he was just a different guy. He was himself talking about Shakespeare. And they, he left the stuff in the movie where he improvises John Wayne doing oh. you know, Macbeth, that stuff. And that's that, where we get the that's Marlon Brando when yeah, he's done. Yeah, I can't yeah. really do. I'm not Robin yeah. Williams, but yeah. he does Marlon Brando doing Shakespeare, and they the, then he does John uh, Wayne. John Wayne, Wayne. yeah, right. right. That, exactly. Those are genius moments. They were, <laughs> and and Robin suddenly it just now he understood that what it would be like to it wasn't just coming in and delivering a lecture. It's a dialogue. You know, he's looking. He's in, and that changed everything and so he started improvising things like dinging the bell with his foot and and, and oh. that sort of stuff so it was it was a good sense that that was what we were looking for and uh, oh, so for instance lines like you know I, I would uh, went to the beach and, and my buddies all I can't even remember my bad line but he would turn it turn it into I went to the beach and they would kick copies of Byron in my face you know <laughs> so it would those kinds of things so, oh that's yeah, cool yeah cool um, what about, uh, oh, Captain, my Captain? Um, now, was there a setup and payoff like that was planned with the getting up on the, the table? Was that like, um, was that in the script originally oh, yeah. or did uh, that come out? Okay. You know, it wasn't, it was interesting because the first draft, when I got through with all that outlining, I still, I knew I had, I had planned the ending where the teacher would, there would be some sort of trial at the school for the teacher mm. and they would throw him out. And I kept thinking, I can't justify this trial. What trial at a school? They'll just fire him. I mean, they don't need to, you know. But I kept writing with that in mind. And all of a sudden, because I had already always planned for him to jump up on the desk in the early part, as soon as he did, I went, oh, I know what to do. And the ending came to me. Mm -hmm. And that's when I really knew I had something that felt really special oh, that, to me. I cried. And Yeah. So, no, that was. I did. Yeah, I yeah. watched again. I cried at the end. Did anybody else cry? Am I the only one? Like, oh, cried. <laughs> Uh, Wonderful yeah, moment. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask you something about script development because this is something that uh, uh, students who get out there in the professional world, whether you're director, writer, producer, will be dealing with the development process. So with Dead Poets, uh, it was made, or you wrote it in 85, yep. made in 88, and released in 89. So right. in between, there was a development process. Uh, but I read somewhere that this was the first time as Jeffrey Katzenberg came in or you had 40 pages of notes. Yes. And then what happened after well, that? Did, uh, that? did that give you a migraine? Were you? No, well, what happened? <laughs> it's on a, a, a Monday night. My agent called me at like eight o'clock and said, I think, uh, first of all, the, the first director had had a deal at Disney to write a, a musical. And he was looking for someone to do it. And, a musical? And, yeah. Was this going to be a musical? No, no, no. Oh, no. thank so, God. No. So, <laughs> my, my, uh, my, agents, my agent called and said, I've given your script, Dead Poet Society, which he said to me, by the way, will never get made. Uh, he said, uh, I gave him a copy, a, a sample writing script. And uh, he's, he's excited he's going to call me tomorrow. So, you know, I said, okay. So then he called me and said, he 
went to Jeff Katzenberg, who ran Disney, and said he doesn't want to do the musical anymore. He wants to do Dead Poets Society, and he gave it to Jeffrey to read. Mm -hmm. And Disney had already passed on it, but Jeffrey didn't know that. So then that was over the weekend, and on Monday night, my agent called and said, Jeffrey's going to buy it tonight. So I said, well, what, what, what are they going to do? What do they want to do to it? He said, I'll find out. So he called me at midnight and said, I, I, I closed the deal. And I said, well, what do they want to do? He goes, oh, I forgot to ask. <laughs> and I said, well, wait a minute. Then there's no deal. He said, I've said close. It's a deal. You'll just, just trust. They, I mean, they like it. They're going to, you know, you, this is the process. So the next day or the day after, uh, I got 40 pages of notes from the studio, and it started with the usual Disney thing of, while we th really like this, this movie, you know, we need to see some changes. The biggest one being that let's forget this whole story about the teacher at this, about the Robin Williams character now. Let's go back and start when he's 19, 20 years old and spend the first half of the movie on him, and it just went on from there. Which is and, a different movie. Totally different. <laughs> so, we really love your yeah, script, but yeah. let's completely change the exactly. movie. <laughs> so I was just, I just covered in sweat. I, I think I read about five pages of it, and just so I called the director, and he said, "Let relax. Let's just go in. We'll we'll talk. We'll see." And, you know, he said, "That's I don't want to make that movie either." So, um, <laughs> so we went in and uh, to Katzenberg's office, and he had he had a fairly large office, and there was kind of a little living room area, and one, area, and he was sitting over at his desk, and in the living room area were five executives, young executives. So I sat down, and we were chatting while Jeffrey was over there by himself, and then suddenly Jeffrey said, "Was look, he was reading the notes, and he said, who did the notes, guys?'" So they all said, well, yeah, we did them. It was a team effort. You know, they're really rough, and we apologize for that. And he said, you're kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, don't you think? And he threw the notes over. And he said, let's just make the movie. And they they left. And uh, we sat down and started talking about casting. And he said, uh, you know, I want to try to get Robin Williams. So that was <laughs> it. I've never had that happen <laughs> again. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that sounds like a dream where yeah, the yeah, head of the yeah, studio throws yeah, out the notes and yeah. says, let's, but let's talk about when it has happened. Uh, so the development process, because I think this is something that, that students need to know about. So what has been a development? Well, they call it what? Development hell? hell? Development hell? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that. Um, um, like what, what have some of those experiences been and how have you worked through getting notes? Uh, you know, it's, I mean, look, everything you write is going to get some notes from from everybody, you know, from the producers, from the director, from the actors. That's just going to happen, and there's going to be shaping that, that goes on. Um, I wrote a movie called Medicine Man that, that started out with, I mean, we, we got Sean Connery involved and a director involved, and so we, we put it together as a movie before uh, selling it to a studio so that, you know, theoretically I would have... We would all have more control mm. over the, the situation, but that uh, Sean Connery got very upset about a couple of lines of dialogue that I that he had that I couldn't figure out how to make work, so he fired me, and then wow. he hired Tom Stoppard, who's a famous British, British. playwright, mm -hmm. to write to rewrite it. And then he called me and said, uh, I've got the stopper draft. I'm not happy. Read it. You know, I'd like you to come back on and tell me what you would do. So I read it and I said, to be honest with you, Sean, I'd only do, you know, what's in, on page 50, that scene from about 50 to 58. That's a really great scene. But the rest, I think, was better the other way. He said, OK. So I did it and he sent it to him and he fired me again. And, oh, and, no. and then, uh, <laughs> then the, direct, the, the director hired a friend of his wife's to rewrite it. And then Sean called me and said, what would you do? And I read it and did one more pass that way and was fired again. And then they made the movie. So uh, and I got the final shooting script and was so upset. I've, I've never seen the movie. Could, You've could, never could seen not. it. I one night I was flipping channels and I saw Sean Connery in a rainforest. I'm going, boy, this looks familiar. <laughs> what is this? And then I went, oh God, it's medicine. Man. Turn it off. <laughs> it was off. just, you know, too painful. But well, uh, and that's, that's just, you know, that's an ego thing. I should have probably been open 
but and and maybe it was a good movie. I don't know. But how uh, is it? Because you wrote the script. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and I'm sure some uh, students may be curious about this. That you write the script, you feel great about your material. What what filters or what things can happen along the way to where by the time it gets to the screen, you're you're it's unrecognizable. What 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 do you think or happened with that? That project. Well, in in general, in Hollywood, especially now, because the the stakes are so high and the cost of writers is relatively low, uh, in general, you can pretty much count on being replaced on for anything you write. Yeah, so you know, uh, so that's the first thing that happens is you're you're fired. <laughs> you know, you do your and work. And you're fired and, three times, three yeah, times. Yeah, whatever. Time. They'll they may bring you back. I mean, the stories now are are you know a lot of these films have. 10, 15, 20 writers on them. Only one or two will get credit. Yeah, but, but, uh, you know, at that point, it's just a free for all. And the pleasure of going to see your work in the theater with something that you wrote, line or dialogue here or there on screen, you know, is diminished. You're just, it's yeah. not going to happen. Uh, if you so do, with if, Medicine Man, you were rewritten, and then also you didn't have the collaborative relationship that you had with, like a Peter Weir, so right. you weren't involved in every stage of the project. And then by the time you saw it, it just wasn't exactly what you had envisioned. It was nowhere near, mm -hmm. as far as I could tell. And yeah. there were lots of reasons for that. And it just, yeah. you know, it was it was an unfortunate sort of yeah. series of events. But that that took that sort of disintegration took place sort of outside the studio. In that case, the studio really was mm -hmm. trusting the, the team, the writer, the director, and the, the, the actor to make the decisions. But, you know, the, the actor has the most power in a, in a movie, and director mm -hmm. close second, and yeah. writer, you don't even rank them. Yeah. You know? <laughs> There's, uh, so the writer's fifth in that uh, out of three. <laughs> so um, it it's... You know, so the that's I mean, something a writer has to develop a thick skin then to be absolutely. able to go through that process absolutely. a number of times. Yeah. Yep. Also, I want to ask you. So you go from um, you go from Dead Poets Society to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, right. And what about Bob? Right. So you're writing drama that's getting uh, Oscar winning drama to family comedy to dark comedy. Mm -hmm. um, how did you not get put into a box? Because there's oftentimes people say, well, what kind of, you're this writer, you're this genre, you're just thriller, you're just suspense, you're just X, Y, Z. How did you break out of being pigeonholed in terms of just drama or even after you wrote these comedy? Um, I, I guess I got, I mean, I got lucky. I, the day that I saw that, that Katzenberg bought uh, Dead Poet Society. I'd sold a, a comedy spec script that that afternoon. So, wow! Yeah, so two it, scripts in one day. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and and by the way, th that morning I had gone into my agent's office to fire him because I could never get him <laughs> on the phone. So it was just you know, and he said, "I know you're here to fire me, but that horrible script you wrote and left you know in my, in my office last week is actually going to sell today. It's going. We're auctioning it off. So come back this afternoon." And then then he said, "The you know Disney's going to buy this." So it was it was a good day, and uh, but it was uh, a good day. Yeah. And and uh, so that comedy got shown around a lot. And, and what script was that? It was called Love at Second Sight. It got made okay. into a movie called Second Sight, which I highly recommend you never see. And, <laughs> oh, no. and uh, 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 and that's one where there's one line of dialogue that I wrote. One that's the only thing left in the entire script. So you were rewritten on that script yes. as well. Yes. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I we were they were that movie got made first, and we were they were shooting Dead Poet Society, and I was came back in town for the screening of of Second Sight, and my parents came in, and you know they were nervous in general about their son in this crazy, you know, business with no net, and uh, so we went to see Second Sight, and my dad, when it was over, looked at me and said, "I think you better get something else to do with your life." <laughs> I'm like, "Oh." God, no, right? yeah. So then I said, well, you know, we've got there's some dailies of dead poets over at Disney. You want to go see them? So he said, yeah. So we went over there and he said, I think you got a chance. <laughs> so, uh, so that changed. Yeah. So that was that was a tough one. But 
you know, the the general situation, the, the director is basically given absolute power over most movies, mm-hmm. uh, particularly ones where that are star oriented, because the stars pick the director, and that that collaboration is is sort of central to the the movie getting made. In the in the sort of Marvel comic book world, the director is really just working for the studio and right. is expendable; doesn't have that power. But the writer, again, just you know, there's 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 no power there. Yeah, um, there's lots of ups and downs in this industry, so. Uh, I have a mentor that's always said you need to have a tent making um, profession or a tent making job, uh, whether that's Starbucks waitressing or doing whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, when you first started off as a writer, started out as a writer, did you have to do uh, something else as like a nine to five or, and, and what did that look like for people? Like what, what did you do? How were you paying your bills when you when, first? When I got out, out of college, uh, I, when I was in college, my senior year, I, we were, I was in a novels class and we were given an option to either write a midterm paper about one of the novels we'd read or we could get grouped together and make a, an 8 millimeter Super 8 film about it. So, of course, everybody in the class yeah. made a Super 8 film, and I got hooked on film. And I, when one of, uh, and I sort of came up with an idea for another one, and I was told that there was a – I went to Vanderbilt. There was a Vanderbilt graduate who had started a company making commercials, uh, and I went – that he might help, so I went to see him, and he said, okay, I'll shoot this for you if you'll come to work for me when you get out of college. And I'm like, great. <gasps> so, uh, you know, but I started out – I was there, worked for him for a year and started out, you know, just as basically a, 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 gl- a gl- gl- excuse me, glorified grip and, uh, oh. uh, and then ended up sort of helping editing things and so forth. And by the time uh, I got to USC Film School, I was sort of a know-it-all. You know, I thought I, I knew everything. And so I, when I left there and went to the Actors and Directors Lab, the first day I was there and I was auditing a directing class, one of the guys came in and said, I just got a contract for three years to make educational films and I need a crew. Is anybody here known in, can work on a crew? And I raised my hand and he said, Okay, come see me in my office tomorrow, and that became my day job. He he would spend two to three weeks making an eight to twelve minute educational film, and then we'd take a week or two off and do it again, you know, over and over again. Great. So it was perfect for a writer because mm-hmm. I would have a week or two off between uh, uh, this job, which was a grind, you know, it was a mm-hmm. production job. So it was six in the morning till eleven o'clock at night wow. every day, but you had the time off, and then. His and wife, you were doing a lot of writing. No, time? no. Oh. His his wife. Uh, uh, I was thinking. I was trying to work on a screenplay, but I was always too tired, and you know the the time off. I was not being as disciplined about it as I should. And one day he came in and said he was his wife was a, a potter, and she was selling pots in San Bernardino. His offices were in Glendale. Every she was selling every weekend in San. And some people came up to her and said, "I know your husband's a filmmaker, and he makes these educational films, and we've seen some." and we like it, we want to back him for a feature. So he came to, to those of us who were working for him, and it was a Monday, and he said, these people, are, well, they want to put up $100,000 for a feature. I don't have a script. Who can write a script by Friday? And I, he said, I'll give you $5,000. I said, okay. So, <laughs> so he said, okay, what do you want? I said, well, for $100,000, it's, it's going to have to be a horror film. And he said, yeah, okay, write a horror. What about? I said, how about a mummy movie? He said, okay. So I wrote a mummy movie by, you know, didn't have to go to work that week. He actually did it. And he said, oh, wow, it's, it's, it's good. It's scary. You know, I'll mm-hmm. give it to them. And unfortunately, they came back and said, you know, Bill, we, we, we think it's really scary, but we're Mormons, and we don't feel like we should back a horror film. <laughs> That's an important yeah. part that got left right, out. <laughs> right. Can, can you make a family film? So uh, he came back and said on Monday, can, and I, I, I said, Bill, I'm just so tired. I, can you give me a week? He said, no, I don't want to lose these people. So we had another guy named Desmond Nakano, who's a writer working for us and Desmond said I can do it and he wrote it a, a, a movie called The Kid from Not So Big uh, and a, a month later we were out in a, a ranch in Saugus making making that movie wow. but the the Mormons were all um, uh, extras in the movie in western costume oh and they goodness. came up to me and said you know we really liked your horror film you know we'll pay you to write a comedy so we want to do a comedy you know and I said well 
okay, so uh, what? And they said, well, we kind of liked the movie Everything You Want to Know About Sex, but not the sex. We just like the structure of it, these, <laughs> these short things. You know, so how about like that, that structure for sports? It's kind of sports shorts, funny. So did that. How did I digress so far? <laughs> um, First but, writing job. Yeah, yeah, so that was my, I wrote that, and then they said, oh, we know you want to direct this, right? And I said, yeah, and they said, we'll give you a test. You can shoot one day, pick a scene or a, a page, whatever, and we did that, and then the head, the guy that was sort of the head producer saw it and said, okay, let's do it, and then he died that night. Oh, my gosh. And these so the the rights to it sort of fell to his wife and we just she had notes and <laughs> that, that was and the then end that of, project went that, away that, yeah yeah so but now i had two scripts uh the horror thing and the 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 sports shorts thing uh and got an agent with them and, you got an agent yeah, with your yeah, writing yeah, samples yeah, yeah exactly so, so yeah more of the story keep yeah, writing yeah keep writing you need and, those and writing samples all you have to do to make it is just keep doing it it's like mm -hmm. if you go to the gym and you exercise your muscle it's gonna get bigger you know and it's the same with writing and the more you do it you just do it and do it and do it and keep learning but the most important thing is is the learning part of it you right. know, is to really really press people friends anybody you let read your stuff for what what really is working and what's not working because well, people are not Necessary. It's not that they're dishonest. They just don't. People. Most people don't like to say, "Yeah, I don't really like what yeah. you just read." So they go, "Yeah, yeah, it's good," you know. Yeah. But if you're not hearing, "Oh my God, this is amazing," then you're not doing it. You right. have to hear that excitement. This is, you know, with dead poets, people were calling me at all hours, saying this. You know, then I knew I had something mm -hmm. pretty good because they were doing that yeah they you know. saw how special yeah, it was yeah. was that your first produced script well was it second sight was my first produced script and then i had i wrote a couple the third thing i wrote got made into a television movie called sins of the father or something okay and so uh, the third thing that you wrote so but those first two were what got you the agent yeah and then, then, I, the then I wrote one. this thing uh, an action piece that got made in as a, as a movie of the week for television and then i think the next thing i wrote was sort of a what what they called space opera, you know, sci a Star mm -hmm. Wars kind of thing, and that got optioned, and I got hired to rewrite it by A and M Records of all, wow. uh, yeah, weird. And then while I was doing that, that's when I started thinking I've got to get this Dead Poets thing written. And uh, Good. tell me, um, what do you think are some of the the biggest changes that you personally have seen um, over the last ten years in the industry? Um, well, it's, there's, there are lots of ways to think about it. I think from sort of the getting started point, there's, it's so much easier and cheaper to make a movie now that, you know, if, if you want to direct in particular, you can, you can get yourself a job doing that by doing what you guys are doing, coming to a film school, learning how to do it, and you can make, you know, a good short or feature film or even several feature films for fairly little money and and get yourself going and and p agents and producers will look at stuff it's mm -hmm. very hard to get people to read but yeah. they will look at something mm -hmm. or at least part of something so uh so it's in a way easier to sort of get going in the business it's harder for them to keep you out and to stop yeah. you from doing what you want to do uh, but then the on the flip side, you know, the most of the the big money in in production, aside from what's going on in television, and that's of course the biggest change is just the the advent of of sort of must see TV. But yeah, TV. From the from the feature side, it's it's all you know big Marvel comics sequel type movies, which the studios control, and everybody is really just you know someone uh, work for hire, mm -hmm. and that's a very hard place to get to because you know they're only going to hire from a, a certain universe of people particularly in the writing directing they're a little more flexible you can make a good indie movie and find yourself directing the next sequel to whatever in the Marvel Jurassic or yeah yeah but but uh, <laughs> Jurassic they, World yeah and then they'll give Islands. you that chance as a writer mm -hmm. but but they won't you know they won't treat you well and they won't pay you well for that mm -hmm. so um, what do you think is the difference between what different muscles does someone have to use figuratively 
for writing for film and writing for TV? Well, TV is a more novelistic form. You know, mm-hmm. it's long. You know, the arcs of the stories are longer. There are more characters. Uh, TV, generally speaking, even if you're running the show, you're not going to write all the episodes. So you're really just planning out a sort of uber plot for the for the whole for a season or five seasons, and then supervising yourself in in a couple of cases and a bunch of other writers in in other cases. But you know, it's it moves slower. You know, there's less going on. If you watch it, the you know the stories evolve usually right. evolve sl- in a, in slowly and. It's it's more like a chapter by chapter, you know, exercise in copying Charles Dickens than it is writing for cinema, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and I love tell the, the stuff on TV is great, and a lot yeah, of it is cinematic great. too, and yeah. beautifully done. But it's just a you know that longer experience. longer arcs, yeah, yeah. and what the, what the yeah. characters are going through. Yeah. What about actually just like. When you're sit, you have to write faster though for TV. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're they're shorter. You know, most mm-hmm. episodes are no more than an hour, and in a lot of cases, if it, unless it's you know for for uh, premium cable, there that's that means forty seven minutes. Mm-hmm. So, forty seven pages. You could you know you ought to be able to do that in yeah, a week in and, a shorter then, period of time. Or, or two weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think are good uh, feeder jobs for? Um, students wanting to get into the industry, maybe even particularly writing or writing, directing. So in other words, that first job, like what do you, what, what suggestions do you have for, I know like writer's assistant, if you want to be on a TV show or writer's PA, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are there any others that, that come to mind to you? You know, I, I, it is, all I would say is get the first job, you know, period, because Mm -hmm. really you, it's, you look back and the, the sort of serendipity of it all is so hard to figure that it it's best to just jump in somewhere, you know, at some point of entry, and then just follow the flow, you know, yeah. and just try, you know, try to wind Get your way that through job. that through from that first job, you know, you'll meet somebody somewhere who's, you know, the first job I had out here while I right before while I was at SC. Some guy said, uh, oh, there's a, a German film uh, documentary crew making a movie about Hollywood, a six-hour movie about Hollywood, and they need a boom man. So I got to go and hold the boom while uh, they interviewed every <laughs> studio head, every major agent, everybody who was anybody in Hollywood, mm-hmm. actors, everyone, and I learned – you know, and this the the German guy who was doing the interviewing was doing it in English, and he was a brilliant guy, and he asking great questions. He knew a lot about the movie business, so it was an amazing education for me to just you know hear about how this all worked. So, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, it was a you know on the surface of it, I was just holding a boom. So <laughs> it, it you know same thing. I think apply. You just you get a job, and I know so many people who have started in the most you know sort of unusual places and ended up running studios or you know writing, directing, everything. It's just it's once you're kind of in a in a decent job, you'll start to meet other people yeah. who, who your boss yeah. knows, et etc. Because this industry is about relationships. We yeah. were yeah. in a meeting earlier where someone was talking about a young woman they knew who wanted to get into the entertainment industry. And uh, she turned down three different job offers because she was like, this wasn't the right company. These weren't quite the right people that I wanted to work with. And he said the same. He was like, just get a job. <laughs> just get in there. Exactly. And what I think, um, you know, it's important to know that once you if you can get on a lot or in a production company or what have you, that's kind of half the battle. Um, and then that's where the relationships that you start forming can turn into other opportunities or maybe working with that right company or, mm-hmm. or what you're desiring to do. Absolutely. How do you feel that uh, young writer directors or writers or directors or writer producers can make themselves more marketable today? Hmm. Um, I mean, marketability really means visibility, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, and it's it's the hardest part, you know, to get people to actually see your work. Yeah. And, um, in, you know, in the old days, there used to be people who tried stunts, you know, they would... <laughs> 
parachute I've heard, into yeah, someone's... Yeah, I've heard about that, know, parachuting. Yeah, yeah those, those kind of things. Or, you know, back before there were actual bombs in the mail, the one agent had an idea. There was somebody wrote a script about a, somebody who had a bomb on a bus. So they sent the spec script out with a little fake bomb, bomb on top. You know, <laughs> Don't wouldn't, do that, that wouldn't today. wouldn't go over today. But, but, uh, <laughs> oh, my gosh, you know, that's intense. My answer to that was to try to put funny, outgoing messages on my answering machine back in the days of answering machines. <laughs> and, and then when they would call to reject me, then, you know, they would hear that. <laughs> what is it? What's one of the messages? What's, I, 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 I don't remember. But they, they, <laughs> but they, were, they were funny? Were, they were funny. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I would – it was working because I could hear – the call, so, oh, and then I'd hear, ha, 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 and then hang up. <laughs> and, and, and then I'd hear some guy go, ha, ha, and he'd hang up. And then the first person would call back and go, so-and-so would like to meet with you tomorrow. you go, okay, it's getting me meetings anyway. So, uh, Hence so, the comedy writer. He yeah, can write comedy. Yeah. So it's, you know, I, I don't really, I, you know, I, I see things on YouTube. People send me things on Vimeo. I don't, I don't know why I watch or, or read certain things and not others. It's really hard to figure out. But I know that part of the thinking of Hollywood agents and managers and so forth is, is that it's a gauntlet and your mm -hmm. cleverness and creativity of get, at getting through the gauntlet and making your, you know, getting recognition is part of how they judge whether your work must be any good. And that's not necessarily true, but that's just the way it yeah. is. So, you know, if you're looking out there and struggling and trying to figure out, it's, it's you know, it, it, look, agents and managers lie all the time. It's just pathological. Yeah. Yeah. So on that level, why tell the truth to them, you know? So, I mean, I used to do things like I would call an agent at an agency and say that some big star that I knew their agency represented had said to call them. Oh, but, no. but I knew that, <laughs> that they couldn't call the uh, William Morris agent actually told me this idea. He said, you know, these lower level agents, if you call and say that Robert Redford recommended you call them, they, they don't know Robert Redford. And they can't call Robert Redford and go do anything. But they're going to, they're going to go, Oh my God, Robert Redford recommended you. Oh, he's, he reckon he knows me. Oh my God. Of course I'll read your stuff. So, you know, you, you just have to use, you also have to know that agents generally all they do is try to steal each other's clients. So if you have oh, an agent that's and good. need another agent, that's the best position to be in because you just call another agent and go, you know, I'm with CAA, but I'm not that happy. Oh, really? They got Now they got a CAA client? You don't even have to be with CAA. They just <laughs> make it up. And they go, of course, I'll read your stuff. You know, So that's because they want to steal clients. That's their job. Okay, you guys uh, are not taking notes on yeah, this part, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> This isn't being recorded. Is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yeah. The inside yeah. sauce yeah. Yeah. here. Um, talk about a time that when you faced failure and wanted to give up. So many times. Oh, my God. Um, you know, it, it, most projects, no matter how successful, will be rejected multiple times i mean it just it goes on and on and the first script i wrote you know it, it became apparent after maybe a month of getting a few rejections that it, it finally dawned on me this is just not going to happen when with uh, my my a script that actually ended up getting made and i remember you know basically kind of crawling into a hole for about three days and just mm. And but slowly you learn. And the next time it happened, it was a day and a half. And the next time it happened, it was half a day. And now it's like, okay, next. You know, mm -hmm. it's just Jeff Katzenberg was that way. He taught me that. He he came to me. We we would he would come to me and say, you know, I just gave it to so and so to star in, and he passed. And I go, Ugh. And he goes, you know what you would do when that happens? And I go, what? He goes, you go next. And you just go to the next one. Mm -hmm. I said, well, that's easy for you to say because you didn't spend months writing this thing. About it. <laughs> right. And he said, I know, right. but that's what you got to do. And that, mm -hmm. that is what you have to do. But it, it hurts, you know. And the hardest thing about it is, particularly with a comedy, is you write a comedy, you know, you, if, if you don't think it's funny, don't give it to anybody. <laughs> so, so by the time you finish, you know, you, you just think, at least I'm laughing all the time. I'm having a good time. I mean, it's still a stressful thing writing, period but I'm having a good time writing this thing and then you give it to someone and it's like it, 
was this a comedy? I, I don't know. You know, and, yeah. and it's so hard. And you try, you try to sync up. How can I think something is so funny <laughs> and nobody else think I must something's wrong with me? You know, and it can be very you know demoralizing and yeah. and you know ego shattering. Yeah. But then you can start to say, well, maybe in that first page, you know, I shouldn't have killed that dog. That set it off the wrong way, <laughs> or whatever. You figure out how to fix it. You know, and again, that a lot of that is probing. I always find the remedy for it is to find some people who you really trust, who will tell you what they really what they feel if asked, and then to ask them for like two or three hours where you just go through everything in the script you can think of, even the things you love, and say, "Why didn't this work? Why didn't that work?" And they'll t if you do it that way, they'll say, "Oh no, that really worked," or "Yeah, this didn't work because," or "I don't know," but you. You really test it, and you find out what's really working that mm -hmm. way, as opposed to getting that, oh, yeah, this was great kind of thing. When you've gone through the rejection, because as an artist, you just have to know that that's going to be part of your reality. Big part. How yeah. has your wife and your family, I believe you have two children? Two children, yeah. How have they factored into just community, um, being able to go through those periods how has family um i kept them out of it i think you, you know my children were not aware of that stuff when they when they were growing up i don't think mm -hmm. um you know f fortunately for both of them by the time they were born my career had sort of taken off so they only knew good times you know <laughs> uh, now that they've got a little older it's you know life is uh they realize it's not going to always be that way. Yeah, but, but, they've gone uh, through the different yeah, seasons. Yeah. Do you, have either one of them gone into the entertainment industry? They, they both are making documentaries. You They're know, documentary over my filmmakers. Big objections. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm, yeah. I'm proud of Docs them for doing that. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And when things got bad with between my wife and I, she left. So I no, <laughs> but, uh, but she's, uh, no. My first wife and I did divorce, but not um, over that. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, um, but, you know, she was my first, we were in it together and she had been a film editor and she knew the business well and it's just, you know, it's part of, part of it. And, you know, if you, I have some of the smartest and best writers I knew, especially when I started, didn't make it because they just couldn't handle the rejection. It was sad because mm -hmm. if they'd stayed in, I know they would have been, you know, successful, but... They just it's really hard and to put up with a lot of no's and a lot of times you never find out why people don't want something most of the time you never find out mm -hmm. not for us that's all you get yeah. <laughs> do you think a person's faith can have any place in their creativity as an artist um, has your own personal faith or if you have a faith has it ever factored into the stories that you've told or the themes or ideas that you've wrestled with i mean i i think you know it's harder on the the studio projects and the stuff you get assigned because so the theme is already perhaps built into the story you're working on so you're really just there to amplify somebody else's theme mm -hmm. but for my own stuff it's you know, I, I'm writing it because I'm trying to, to, I have something I'm trying to convey that I believe in. And mm -hmm. it's my own passion for that that keeps driving me to, to write it and try to make it work in a way that doesn't make that theme very obvious, but makes the theme work on people anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think faith or belief or, or a passion for a, a theme is essential. I think if without it, what are you writing about or why? Mm -hmm. you know? I once uh, heard that it that certain artists or filmmakers, it seems like there's there's one common theme or idea that mm -hmm. they're constantly wrestling with through different films. Like maybe they might say Scorsese or whatever. Do you right. feel that there's one that you are? I don't think so. I've looked mm -hmm. back through my stuff and tried to, you know, I've had that question before and I just, I don't see a common theme mm -hmm. in, in my stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, I don't know. Different yeah. ones for different projects. I guess you know, mm -hmm. and after I, I I can be really passionate about something while I'm writing it, and when I'm done, I'm sort of just okay. I've processed that, so you know, next now what? Mm -hmm. You know, what else? What's what's bubbling up next? Yeah. Did you enjoy directing? I know it's a completely a, uh, different. It's a it's sort of. 
I mean, <laughs> someone said it's like playing chess with the universe, and it's true <laughs> because you get up, you know, and it's raining on a day that it's supposed to be clear, and now you can't shoot those scenes, and you got to, or you know, your star shows up five hours late, and uh, you, now you don't get to shoot that scene at all, and the movie's a farce, so it's you know everything. It's like dominoes. If every, one domino, if you pull five of them out, the whole thing just stops. You know, mm -hmm. but somebody just pulled them out because the star didn't show up that day, and there you can't get back to that location. Mm -hmm. And so you just you're rewriting all the time. It's torture, you know, absolute torture. Right. And uh, to have to rewrite and then also be on set directing yes, and everything. Yes, so you yes. prefer the writing? Uh, I, you know, the days that things went well on the set directing, the days that the weather was right and everybody showed up and we had days that were f fairly e reasonable in terms of making our days, that was fun. But uh, And the good thing about directing is is when you're the writer, you know, you're the one that has to solve all the problems. If you're the director and you walk out on the set and something doesn't look good, you go, I, I just don't like the way those curtains look. And you walk away. And you come back <laughs> and they're somehow right yeah. the next time, you know. So people, other people fix those things for you so it's I like that <laughs> <laughs> that aspect of it cool yeah. so now we are going to take questions from the audience and I guess other audiences that are either social media or digital audiences hmm. so I guess we'll start with our audience here is there anyone who has a question for mr. Shulman yes no yes am I taking yeah My budget after college? This is practical. Oh, what was oh, your budget? practical? <laughs> well, you know, when I got out of college in the sort of Jurassic period, things were very cheap. You know, you could buy food with a small stone. So uh, I think, you know, I, when I tell, you know, I was living in a fairly amazing apartment in, in, in Hollywood with a view of the entire city and paying $135 a month. You know, so people, you know, my, I told my wife, I showed her the place and told her that she just said, you know, you're a writer, stop making things up. But that's, it, that's, that's how it was fair, you know, and that was kind of like, ooh, this is a little bit tight. Uh, and I, I had, I had good luck in that I had that job working, making the educational films and, you know, got paid pretty well for it. So. I got lucky out, out here, you know, and got lucky in in you know in Nashville g getting that job with the co with Image Maker, the co that company. So, um, and you know, people talk about having a backup, and I think that's good, except that everybody I know that had a backup ended up doing the backup. So it's you know it's because the backup is usually something that's a little bit easier than what you're struggling to do. So I I can't. In, in good conscience say don't have a backup because you know you're going to be out on the street somewhere but you know if you have that that safety net that backup somewhere and and things start to get really hard and do in the writing or whatever else you're probably going to end up in that secondary area and that's you know I, I don't know I mean I remember at age 31 thinking oh my god if if this doesn't start happening for me soon I'm I'm really going to be in trouble because there's you know I'm, it's I'm too old to go to medical school or law school, any of those things I'm I'm stuck you know but um, I, okay. I got lucky. I have another question. Yeah. Uh, would you be willing to talk about your film that's in development, Morgan Summit? Uh, yeah, it's been in development for nine years. So oh, it's that happens. Just, yeah, and it's been bouncing around from from actor to actor. Uh, Terrence Howard is now uh, mm -hmm. supposed to star in it, and you know we're having a little bit of trouble, not because of Terrence, but just because of the nature of the material, um, finding the financing. We've had enough financing at, at, on two occasions, and it sort of uh, with different actors, and that we got ran into budget problems. So now I'm hoping we're going to resolve that. Okay, yeah, so. and that's a reality for all of us to know. Sometimes films can be in development for years. And yep, yep. You might have to put one down and come back to oh, it. Oh, this one has just been, I, I yeah. almost forgotten it exists. <laughs> 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 what about Bob is one of the funniest movies I've ever seen. What is your process for writing comedy? Is that my wife writing it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, 
to me, the, the idea has to be funny. If the idea is funny, then it's going to take you where you need to go. You know, if you're trying to make something that's not such a funny idea funny, then you're going to end up sort of writing a lot of funny bits and sort of destroying the reality of it. Mm. So I think you kind of need an overarching concept that, that that's funny, and then you don't really have to be funny. It, it will deliver it for you, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and what about Bob? I thought had a very funny premise, and yeah, and that it made me laugh every time I thought about it. <laughs> and it was also the kind of premise that de- kept delivering to me funny ideas for how to keep it going. How did you balance the darker humor and the lighter jokes? I didn't th- see anything dark about it. Well, I mean, it was I, I, explosive. It, well, explosions. When, and... yeah, when you know he's trying to kill him by blowing up the house, but okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember Michael Eisner, you know, came in and said, you know, this has got to have a happy ending. I mean, you can't just have, you know, so they tried to sort of jam that in for a while. And, and he says, you know, it's a dark, we don't do dark comedies here at Disney. The movie was made at that point. So, uh, and that was the first time that occurred to me it was a dark comedy. I just didn't, didn't see it that You didn't way. see yeah. that. <laughs> One of the questions is, how often do you get writer's block feel like your work isn't very good? Um, I don't get writer's block. I've only gotten it once, and that was the day I had to start writing Honey, I Shrunk the Kids because I only had five days to rewrite it. And and I had taken three days, the first three days, they hired me on a Wednesday, and then Thursday I looked at all the storyboards for the the bee, bee chase and all that stuff, and I said, i got to have a couple days to think about what to do, and they were just apoplectic no you got to start right now go down we're giving you an office get in there and start right because they were <laughs> they had a big problem and i said i can't start till monday and they i spent all weekend with jeff katzenberg calling me every two hours have you started yet why aren't you starting i don't understand can't you start early you know all that stuff so finally on monday i said okay i guess i really do have to start and i sat down and i just i was you know i like to say i was so nervous my dog was throwing up it oh was just, no and i sat there and i just paralyzed and, mm. and I'm like oh my god and my wife came in and, and went what's I said I, I've, I've got writer's block I can't she goes what's wrong I said I don't know how to start this now she said well write the second scene I said ah oh, good idea so I started writing the second <laughs> scene loop back into the first that's literally the only time that ever happened so mm, and just pressure yeah write the second scene don't yeah, forget no, that you just it, I'm the truth remember is, that one. you just there's always something you can do you mm-hmm. might not be able to write the scene you're working on right. but so write an easy scene Go while you're writing else. the easy scene the harder scene will come to you okay good um, avoid what? avoidance is the way to do it, you know. <laughs> constant avoidance. <laughs> yeah. um, mentors. I know you mentioned uh, that you that Dead Poet Society was about someone who was a great mentor. Mm-hmm. What's the best piece of advice you've gotten for writing, and what's the worst? Wow. Uh, <laughs> Well, the best piece was probably to stop writing. That was uh, the first, the third script that I wrote. I gave the, my agent called and said, "Oh, we've got a producer who's really excited about it." And I went in and he said, "Where are you from?" And I said, "I'm from Nashville." And he said, "Go back, leave." <laughs> I, uh. said, I said, "He said, I said, you're taking a meeting with me just to tell me to leave." He said, "I thought I'd do a good deed today." I said, "Wow." So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was the best advice. I should have taken him up on that. No, but, uh, yeah, I thought you were uh, going to say that lit a fire yeah. under you. Well, I don't. I just at that point it was probably just a little too late in, in my mind to leave. But uh, <laughs> um, best advice um, was that was that that was the worst or the best? That that was the best. The, the, no, uh, no, that was the that was the worst. I guess <laughs> uh, one of the worst days for sure. Um, the best advice, somebody told me this story about a, a, they did an experiment in a class of, of potter, a pottery class. Mm. And they had, they split the class in two and they had 15 people make as many pots as they could in an hour. And then they had the other half try to make the best pot that they could in an hour. And then they labeled them and they brought the faculty in. And, you know, it was a blind judgment and they picked the five best and they were all ones that were made from the fast group. And so, and the lesson being, write a lot. Mm, write a lot. 
and, and writing is rewriting. And writing is re well. That's yeah. yeah. I mean, people say I have a friend who's got a great idea. She's been working on it for a while. I think it's going to be a, a a great TV series. And she said, "I've just finished the first draft. It's hot off my typewriter. I'm dying for you to read it." I said, "When you have." Reach the thirtieth draft. <laughs> I'll read it. You know, don't ever ask anybody to read anything that you know is that it, anything is. If you know anything is wrong with it, fix it before. Right. And when you look through it with the most critical eye that you can, I always ask myself when I get done, what is what's likely to be the criticism of this? Mm -hmm. And if I ask that question, I know the answer. I fix it. Then I ask myself, what's right. the next criticism? All yeah. the way down. And when I can't think of anything anybody's going to tell me, that's when I show it because now I don't mm -hmm. know what to do. And so you really look at the story. You really wrestle with the story. You go through your own somewhat like development process before even absolutely ever showing yeah. it. Yeah, that's I don't, so I'm important. I'm trying not to embarrass yeah. myself as as much as I can. Well, so. I even tell my students, I'm like, do not turn this in riddled with typos. Yeah, you would never do that in the industry. No. But yeah, there you go. Thank you. And I have people. I have people. Thank you. Talk to them. Talk people to will give me something to read, students. and I'll say, you know, I'll, I think these are the things that need to be fixed. They're not working, and they go, well, could you think? It be okay if I gave it to so this agent or this producer I mean they can they can sort of see that and I said no why would you do that if you th if I, you may not agree with me in which case give it but if you think those are good things you need to fix f never have anything in there you have to apologize for right. you're gonna have to anyway people will find all kinds of things wrong you didn't know but if you think if you know something's wrong fix it before anybody sees it and mm -hmm. you know read through it 10 15 times before you give it to somebody else and when you read through it you're going to make a lot of changes yeah and you can't figure out anything else to change then it's time to let some people see it yeah what is your litmus test for when you get notes to know which ones to address or like really listen to because sometimes you're getting different notes like you said from the studio head the director the actor and what notes to throw out the window? The exciting notes, the ones that are ones you want to do, that's the ones you do. The mm -hmm. others you don't do. Mm -hmm. okay. Good. I mean, I, you know, you try to be open, but, you know, and you'll be in, and look, it's the, a lot of the people who give notes, it's their job and they're really good at it. There's some really, I mean, I've been working with on a TV series and the, the development person with the company, she's fabulous. I mean, mm -hmm. I just love her feedback and you know and every not everything but a lot of things she says I go oh wow great idea mm -hmm. those are the notes I can't wait to do those things mm -hmm. the ones that are like eh, no that's gonna unravel this and that you know those are the ones you don't do mm -hmm. and I treat the note process you know as writers we have sort of you know a certain amount of pride of authorship about what we do and the people who give you notes have pride of authorship about what they do and I know as a writer that if someone starts off saying to me, wow, I love this. It's da, 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 da. it's great. Uh, I'll do almost anything after that. You know, I'm putty in their hands. And the same goes for the way you handle development people. Because mm -hmm. if they give you notes, the best thing to say, even if you hate it, is, wow, that's really interesting. You write it down. You make them feel like they've <laughs> given you something good. Then they feel good. And when you don't do half their notes, they're fine because you, <laughs> you love them. So they're, they're, oh, okay, didn't do that. That's great. That's fine because you were open. But if yeah. you if you're closed and shut down, then they just go, uh oh, another defensive writer yeah. gone. Yeah, I've learned that process. So many people are wary of killing off characters, especially primary characters in films. You did it with such grace and, and in a purposeful way in Dead Poet Society. What advice would you give concerning the death of a character so it's done in a way that furthers the plot? Well, it has to further the plot and it has to further the theme. You know, there was, I mean, Peter Weir came to me a couple of days after we started shooting and he said he had had a conversation with Ingmar Bergman, who's, you know, I hope you guys know who he was. Uh, and Bergman said to Peter, you know, if you kill off one of the main characters in your movie, the audience will never forgive you. Mm. And I said, uh oh, <laughs> what, what are we going to do about that? And he goes, we're going to hope he's wrong. And I said, okay. So, um, and because of the theme of the movie, the Robert Sean Leonard character had to die, you know. But we, I, I was thinking all along, is there any other way I can sort of drive home this theme without doing that? And I couldn't. So, but 
at one point, the, the, the big change that Peter Weir made me make in the script or asked me to make in the script because it was funny or weird with the way he handled it. But he said um, I had once – there was a scene in the movie where the kids are in the script – about page 70 where the kids go to class and the the teacher's not there there's a substitute mm. and they found out that the, that the robin williams character is in in the hospital oh. so they go to see him and it turns out he has non-hodgkin's lymphoma which you can live with for 20 years 30 years sometimes but your life is going to be shortened and he's back in class the next day and so his old self and for me i put it in there because it explained the sort of carpe diem of him he's got oh. more and Peter said, you got to take this out. You know, it's going to, the movie will sort of be reviewed as a weepy. And it's, it's, and he, and so we argued about it for a while. And he even said, I, if you don't take it out of your own free will because you want to, I'm not directing the movie. I'm like, oh, oh what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> and so, so we talked about it. And then finally, one morning he called and he goes, I finally figured out why it should go. And I said, why? He said, you know, you, when those kids stand up on their desks at the end, Anybody would stand up for s someone who's dying. I mean, that just, he said, oh, but if he's yeah. not dying, then we know they're standing up because of what he taught mm. them and what. So I went, oh, damn, you're right. So <laughs> that was the end That's, of that. It's, yeah. that it's, yeah. it's so powerful. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, what is next for you as a writer? I'm sure we're all interested to know. Yeah, that. I'm working on a couple of TV series. Yeah, a, mm. a comedy, a half-hour comedy, and a, a, a 12-hour limited series, which is a drama, a very violent, unfortunately, drama, but wow. based on a true story. So, okay, so yeah. a comedy and a drama. Yeah, I yeah. think that's so wonderful that you can move between both. Yeah. Well, we'll uh, see if I'm any good uh -oh. <laughs> in this case. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to see. So, are we? How are we doing for time? Trying to, I can't really see anybody. You can text it to me how much time we have left. Um, <laughs> see. So next year, next year marks the 30th anniversary of the release of Dead. This is the this year is the 30th anniversary of when it was completed. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And 2000 I think it was released in '89, summer of '89. Right. Yeah. So next year marks the 30th anniversary. Um, for the release and when you were writing it and I can probably I'm sure I could probably answer this myself but did you have any idea and and by the way congratulations on the 30th anniversary Thanks. coming up but did you have any idea that it would become such a timeless classic and have so much impact 30 years later yes no I, <laughs> no. Uh, no I mean I, I, you know when you're for me when I'm writing everyone feels pretty good when I'm doing it especially as I get toward the end and you know people have read it and I feel good about it and this one felt particularly strong but you know who knows and they, it's I, I adapted it into a play and and we put it on in New York and yeah. now it's it's it around, sort of going around the world in foreign in foreign language form. Great. My wife and I just went to Japan uh, about a month, two weeks ago, and saw it the opening of it there in Japan. And it's just the weirdest feeling to be sitting there and kind of take yourself back to sitting in my little room writing this thing, and never in a million years thinking I'd be watching it in Japanese. You mm -hmm. know, it, it's it's a bizarre feeling. Yeah, yeah. I read yeah. about the play. Congratulations yeah, on that too. Yeah. That's exciting. So, um, hmm. I'd like to wrap up before and just ask one last question, which is, when I say, oh, captain, my captain, what does that evoke for you? I, it's been so long that, <laughs> that I mean, uh, I mean, it, it, it brings Robin to mind mm -hmm. for me, you know, mm -hmm. and um, just, you know, what a sweetheart of a guy he was and just a, a great person to work with and you know, brilliant, probably one of the most brilliant people I've, you know, you could see the rapid, his mind, how quick he was and, um, and just a generous guy and, and, uh, uh, how sad it is that, that I don't know exactly what happened. I don't know if anybody really knows what, you know, they, uh, in the process, I got to be friends with one of his best friends who, maybe his best friend and who knew nothing about what was going on and he just to this date i don't think believes the sort of story in the press about really? the i mm -hmm. mean it's just 
hard to figure. So, um, cause, but he had a hard, you know, his last year professionally was really difficult. He mm -hmm. had that TV series that opened huge and then was canceled by the end of the season. Mm -hmm. And he had a couple of movies come out that didn't do well and got, you know, slaughtered by the critics. And then, I, you know, I don't, I know he had too thick a skin to, to, to do that, to kill himself over, you know, this but mm -hmm. uh it's just you know he was such a great spirit so yeah i was thinking of the irony of how he's just a source of strength and uh encouragement for the neil character to pursue his art yeah and just what happened in real life yeah um yeah for me i just know personally um, a, such an important thing is that while I love writing and love the industry and all the work that I can do is just I can't have my identity in it. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to have my identity grounded elsewhere um, because it's just too it's it's just not it, there's nothing beneath it. Right. And for that's me, that's so healthy. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's my faith. Hey, I wasn't there at 20 years old. That's for sure. Right. right. But anyway. Um, Tom Shulman, you are just an amazing talent oh, thank and a you. very thank cool you. person. Thank you so much for your it's time. A real pleasure talking Let's give to you. a thank final you. round of applause for Oscar winner Tom Shulman. Give a round of applause for Camille, for Professor Tucker, for leading us in the discussion today. Um, and again, if you're joining us on the live stream and you are looking at film schools, you're wondering, man, where could I land? We'd love for you to check it us, uh, check us out at biola.edu slash film. Uh, see what we're all about. Our regular deadline is December 1st for application, so we'd love for you to apply. Tom is gracious enough to stick around, get to meet with some of you that are here uh, in our studio. So uh, stick around for that and uh, get to shake Tom's hand and talk a little bit about uh, the industry. Um, and so thank you guys so much for coming. Have a great evening.